I'll kind of start with something different than what I had. Um, the talk today is about managing turf weeds and some turf biology stuff. I'll admit I know quite a bit about weeds, but I don't know everything. So I go to my books and my resources. Um, one of my favorites, and I have a slide on this. I don't know if you guys can see this, is Weeds of the Northeast. This is a book. I've got my dog tags in here. Um, I write in it. This one has a lot of good information as far as the names or synonyms of different weeds. Uh, what I call ground ivy, you might call creeping Charlie. What someone might call mare's tail, someone else might call um, horseweed or something different. And that's more of a regional thing. So this uh, weeds of the Northeast is a good one for nomenclature. And also to look up similar types of weeds, weeds that look similar, but maybe have a different life cycle. So uh, that's another thing that we can look at. My second favorite weeds book is Weeds of the Midwestern United States and Central Canada. This is the one, this is my picture book. So it's got all the things that I need as far as different life cycles, seedlings, um, also growth stages, kind of where they're found. This one is nice because I don't know if you can see it real well. It's got a picture of the United States and the gray areas where you will find it. And then that just kind of lets you know what uh, areas or what you might be looking for. And then because I'm a turf guy, I have got my turf grass weed control for professionals. This one may be not as used by the homeowner uh, three or four years ago, but recently the author of this, uh, Dr. Aaron Patton, who is the state extension specialist for turf grass, he added pictures with different weeds in it. So it's got a lot of good information, hard to control weeds, but it also has a lot of herbicide information, which maybe the homeowner would not care to deal with, but that's another good source um, to have. It looks like I can share my screen now. So we're gonna get to a PowerPoint so you don't have to look at my face the whole time. And if I could just get someone to say they can see the PowerPoint, that would be great. We can see it, Jeff. How's that? Good. All right, so let's jump into it. What time we got? All right, so we're gonna try to keep this to a half hour. Again, if you have questions, uh, throw those in the chat box. Um, as promised, we will be talking about ground ivy. We will be talking about dandelions. I'll give some information on that. And then I'll review those books because um, I have slides on them. And that way, uh, for the recording, all this will be recorded. So you'll have that information available to you uh, in the future. And just a shout out again to Dr. Patton, who we worked on this uh, presentation a while ago. I've modified it for our time. So uh, we'll just go right to it. Pesticide nomenclature. The reason I put this up first is because one of the things I get asked is, hey, I have this weed in my lawn. What do I spray? I'm not going to tell you to spray Roundup because that is the trade name. I do not care about the trade name. What I care about is the common name, which is going to be the chemical name. So a lot of times what, it'll, what I'll say is, well, if you have an area where you want to uh, control everything to kill the grass and the weeds, I would say use glyphosate. And there are many different trade names of that. So a common name, if you hear me say, uh, something that sounds a little goofy. It's, pro the, it's probably the common name um, because that's how I usually will uh, guide people because whether you go to Walmart or Big R or Tractor Supply, they all have different products. And then there's the chemical name. This is what you'd only see if you're uh, writing up a thesis or something similar to that. All right. So cultural methods of weed control. These are the things that we can do that uh, do not involve um, herbicides, but they're things, practices we can do that make our turf grow thicker and more um, competitive or able to outcompete the weeds. So adapted turf grass, which we discussed last week, choosing the right species for your area. Fertilization, making sure that your turf has all the nutrients it needs, mowing correctly, that's a frequency and a height issue. Um, watering is a big one. Uh, just a quick review, if you are seeding, you want your watering to be light watering and infrequent. If you have an established lawn, you want that watering to be infrequent and deep. Drainage is a big one too, making sure you don't have excess water. And then compaction relief in the form of core aerification. 
And then this is something I always like to talk about is your expectations. Some people don't mind having weeds uh, because it's an area that's not often used. Um, but the other thing that we think about with turf, one of the benefits of turf is it is a soft surface. So if you have kids running around playing um, football or soccer, when they fall, you want them to fall on something soft. So a, a dense turf grass is gonna be a good cushion. If you're having a bunch of weeds in your lawn, such as crabgrass or dandelions, you're looking at not as soft of a cushion for uh, the con when you have make contact with the ground, but also traction. Um, sprained ankles and, and broken bones usually happen when you don't get a good pivot or you can't stop as quickly. Well, weeds are definitely gonna contribute to a lack of traction. So that's another reason to have um, some good healthy turf, especially where you have high uh, travel, high traffic areas. Okay, a lot of information on here, but as far as weeds go, we're looking at summer annuals, winter annuals, and then biennials, and most importantly, perennials. Perennials are an issue because unlike farm fields, we don't get to till our yards every year. We don't get to spray the whole field uh, to, to burn off different weeds. So we do have turf, which is a plant in the, in the yard, and we have to be careful that we're choosing the correct herbicide um, that will kill the weeds, but not harm the grass. And there are cool season perennials and warm season perennials. And then the annuals, just going back up to the top there, annuals meaning one year, they will germinate in the spring and they will set seed in the fall. Um, winter annuals germinate in the fall and grow until the spring and then die uh, as the temperatures increase. Biennials are two years. So the first year they will grow vegetatively. So they're just growing leaves. And then the second year they will be reproductive stages. That's when they'll set their seed. So here's a visual of our winter annual, starting in the fall, ending in summer where the seed will set. And then we're just gonna go through some common uh, winter annuals. This is annual bluegrass or poa annua. This is gonna be more of an issue in golf courses. But if you look where this golf ball is sitting here in the lower left picture, you see where you have this nice dense green turf, then you have this lighter green, maybe not as dense, not as uniform turf. That's gonna be your poa annua. The reason this is a weed is because it has seed heads that will uh, appear even if it's on a putting green. So it is a very good setter of seeds. And it's one of those that can um, decrease uh, aesthetic uh, ability, but also ball roll and things like that. And bit, this is the one you're gonna see in your yard. Uh, it's got these rough flowers here that sort of encircle the stem. It is in the lamium or the mint family. So when you mow this, it is gonna have a bit of an odor and it has a square stem. Uh, again, really unsightly in the spring before the grass uh, greens up, but this is one that you're gonna to wanna to con uh, control in September or October before it gets into spring. Purple dead nettle, it's cousins, again, in the lamium family. It will have a square stem. It's gonna be really green and big in the spring before the turf greens up. Um, but again, this is one that you really want to hit in the fall with your herbicides. Because um, if you do that, then you won't have the issue so much in the spring. Common chickweed, I just pulled a bunch of this out of my mom's flower beds uh, the other day. And this is one where, uh, if you look in this picture, hey, Corey, can you see my mouse as I'm going over the picture here? Or am I just doing that for myself? No, you can, you can barely see it, though. Okay. Well, on the bottom left picture, you can see there's a, um, a plant there, the weed, and it, it grows out from the center. So this is one that one little start can really spread out across an area. So very, pretty unsightly. And then our summer annuals germinate in the spring, and then by the fall, they're setting seeds. And usually they will die out by the first frost. Large crabgrass, we will dive into this um, a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, but some of the things that we look for in large crabgrass are going to be those hairy leaves and the hairy stems. It has this large seed head. And then for those who have a little bit of background in turf, the ligule is very large and membranous. Some of them do have hairs there at the junction. Um, but again, this is one of those that grows really quickly and has that light lime green color. So it's one that people try to avoid in their lawns. Goosegrass. Just think of crabgrass, but it germinates and grows about two weeks after. A um, little different, it's folded in at the bud, continuous collar. Um, and unlike 
crabgrass, it has uh, smooth hairless leaves. Prostrated spurge, another big summer annual. This is one you'll see uh, sort of as we're getting into July. The grass might be going a little dormant. This one will stay green. Uh, it does, it is like tiferous, meaning it has the milky white sap. The only good thing about this weed is if you can find the center and pull it, you should be able to get most of these leaves um, if it is in the garden bed or something like that. All right, perennials. These are some of the best ones. They're my favorites. Good job security for the turf industry. Dandelions. So we all know the dandelion. Um, they have the rosettes. Germination is interesting because they tend to grow any time of the year. Um, if I did a poll, I would assume that many of you have seen dandelions blooming most of the year. If we have a warm spell in December, the side of a house, uh, sometimes these guys will put up flowers, but we are just getting to the end of our uh, dandelion flush here in the spring. We had kind of a cooler spring, so it's backed up a little bit than normal. Um, but the reason that these guys are so difficult is one, you see the seed head here that will travel by wind or mowing. A lot of times too, after a rain, they'll get stuck to clothing, so they do travel well. Um, but the other thing is this long tap root. And that's why they're such an issue to get controlled. You need to spray them at the right time and also use the right amount of herbicide, which we will jump into in a bit. This is one that uh, I dug out during my uh, graduate studies um, at Purdue. I just needed a picture of the tap root and that's about uh, eight or nine inches long. And, and that's by no means the largest um, out there. All right, so I'm gonna do a bit of a sales pitch. They came out with a app for your smartphone called the Purdue Turf Doctor. So the reason I'm selling it is because it has information for, I believe, 135 instances. Now, instances mean weeds, uh, insects, fungal diseases, and then also rodents and other uh, biotic factors that could hurt your turf. So if I'm looking for dandelion on this app, I would click it. It would give uh, alternate names, scientific names, conditions that promote the problem. That's a big one. So if you're mowing too short or you don't have enough nitrogen, you are opening the door for your dandelions. But then you look at this third screen on the right, cultural control. So management practices such as increased mowing heights, nitrogen fertility, and irrigation will help to produce dense, vigorous turf capable of outcompeting dandelions. Now that paragraph, that's gonna be applicable to many of the weeds that we are dealing with in turf. Um, one way, and that's something, if you don't wanna use chemicals, then plan on beefing up your turf uh, to prevent those weeds from getting uh, established. Biological control, you're not gonna find many biological controls for weeds, that's gonna be more for your pests and your bugs and maybe a greenhouse setting. Um, but then the chemical control, that's where we see uh, this is where maybe you have an infestation, your neighbor has a dandelion farm and you're getting these seeds come in and you really wanna take care of them. Uh, it has this bit about chemical control where it says here, many herbicides effectively control dandelions, especially those that contain 2,4-D. Fall is the best time to control perennial broadleafs like dandelion. And this is something where dandelions we see in the spring, that's when we're concerned about them. But if you can hold off Spray in the spring if you want to, but if you can get a fall application for your dandelions, you're gonna get as good, if not better control of those dandelions. Okay, we had a lot of uh, questions about this last week. So this is our ground ivy or our creeping Charlie. This guy uh, does a really good job of spreading in this bottom right picture at every node where you see the leaves jumping off, you're seeing roots come out as well. So if you were to pull this parent stem to the right out, every other spot here has a root establishment where it would be able to pull water and continue the cycle. So maybe one of the most important slides of the uh, presentation here for those with ground ivy, um, all our information uh, with alternate names and things like that, our cultural control, uh, a little bit more aggressive. So aggressive growth and establishment, there are very few cultural practices that have been observed. So that means you're probably gonna have to do something on the chemical side. And I think to kind of sort everything out, repeat applications of two or three-way mixtures of 2,4-D, dicamba, MCPP, 
uh, or MCPA, and then those are ingredients that you are going to find in any three-way herbicide. Um, the most popular would probably be a Trimec formulation, um, but what you want to do is look at your labels, which we'll get into in a second here, and look for those different ingredients. And then beyond that, we have the uh, herbicides containing triclopyr typically provide better control uh, and additionally products with, so triclopyr or fluoroxapyr. And again, this is one of the reasons why I like the app. I have, I come from a large family. So if I get a sibling that has an issue, I will screenshot this and send it to them because then they can look back at it and have those resources right at, right at the tips of their fingers. All right, white clover. Um, this is one of my favorites. Uh, during quarantine, we have a lecture time, so I go out and look for four-leaf clovers. This is one that tells me, if I see this in your lawn, that means you're probably not fertilizing. So if you want a longer term program, you could hit a little bit of nitrogen on this, on your lawn in the fall and maybe the spring, and slowly the turf would have the nitrogen they needed uh, to outgrow um, this white clover, because clover will produce its own nitrogen, which makes it um, able to compete against turf in low fertility lawns. Okay. So why would we identify annuals versus perennials, which means we're gonna be looking at pre versus post control options. And then variations in response to herbicides, you need to select the right product. Um, there's gonna be a different uh, schedule that you would go for for annuals than you would for perennials. Um, we'll get into it a little deeper, but for an annual, you might be looking to do a pre-emergent. Think of your crabgrasses that are weed and feed crabgrass preventers versus your perennials that have already established, a pre-emergent will not work on those because they are already um, above the ground. So you will need to use a post-emergent herbicide. Life cycles, flowering and seed production. So you really wanna get those weeds before they replenish the seed bank in your soil. Um, the reason they're weeds is because they are very good at what they do, which is pr produce a lot of seeds or have some sort of survival tactic um, that make them a problem, an issue, uh, unsightly, things like that. And then impress your friends and neighbors. I take pictures of weeds um, in, in folks' lawns that are really bad, but also just um, as a way to, you know, get your knowledge up. If you do look at weeds, one thing I kind of found, and as far as learning weeds, if you learn a weed, start looking for just that weed, and the more you recognize it, the more you'll see it. So that's a good way. That's how I learned to identify a bunch of weeds is one week I looked up a uh, black medic, for instance, and then within the next few weeks, I was seeing it everywhere, able to identify it. And that just helps uh, stick in your brain. Okay, we're gonna jump into some crabgrass control. So the biology, it's an annual, needs light to germinate, invades quickly and Tall fescue in Kentucky bluegrass mown less than greater than three inches has must, much less crabgrass. So that last bullet point is our cultural control. The higher you mow, the less chance that crabgrass has to germinate in your lawn. And then this is just a review on herbicide classifications. Pre-emergent herbicides are applied before weeds germinate. Post-emergent herbicides apply after weeds germinate. Pre-emergent herbicides are the foundation of crabgrass control. If you can put down a pre-emergent for crabgrass, that will work better, excuse me, than post-control. So when is the typical application for timing for pre is March, but it can be applied in April. Uh, we talked about this last week, the growing degree day tracker. We are a little bit late as far as pre-emergence. Um, this screenshot was taken April 22nd. So for our crabgrass pre in Wabash, we're in the orange area here. We would have been considered late for the crabgrass pre-emergent for April 22nd. And then for crabgrass germination though, in Wabash, the germination was early on April 16th. So it's one of those things where do what you can, but there are options believe I didn't want to do that. Okay, what did I do? Can you guys still see the screen okay? 
Yes, Jeff. Yes. Okay, thank you. So timing, crabgrass germination. Um, this is a generalization. You see Fort Wayne, April 29th. I'm almost certain that in Fort Wayne, Lafayette, April 29th, 26th, we did not have crabgrass germination because we still had snow and frosts and freezing temperatures. So that had not germinated yet. So that's something where go visit that Growing to Green Day tracker to find out where we're at um, with, uh, with crabgrass germination. And then reasons for pre-emergent failure. So applied after the weed emergence, no activating rainfall or irrigation. If you're applying a pre-emergent, again, for Mother's Day, uh, did some landscaping, uh, and we were, I was trying to remember to put down the pre-emergent before I put the mulch down, but then I was looking for rain events afterwards to make sure that that would be, um, that would be activated. And then drought causing the turf to decline and favoring crabgrass growth, that's sort of beyond your control unless you have irrigation. And then improper calibration of spreader or sprayer. So always make sure you read the label and are getting your amounts correct. Pesticide nomenclature, we are going to talk about some pesticides real quick, but again, I'm going to be using the common name uh, for those things. So pre-emergence for crabgrass. You're going to be using something with either podiamine, dithiopure, or pendimethalin. Uh, always look. Um, some of these will be restrict use pesticides only for golf courses or athletic fields. Um, but these are the three that you're going to mostly be looking for if you're going to uh, the retail store for your crabgrass control. So the turf builder, the Holtz crabgrass preventer, I think these are a good option because it prevents crabgrass and fertilizes at the same time. And then you look, it does have pendimethalin in it, so that's going to be your crabgrass control. There are a lot of options, so uh, this one does have a good amount of nitrogen in it, crabgrass preventer, these are the best in the spring. So we have the dithiopure in that one. Okay, here's a good image of pre-emergence. Uh, the weed seeds germinate and are controlled as they come in contact with the herbicide. You see this herbicide layer between the dotted line. And that's where it's not going to allow the seed to penetrate the surface. Those seedlings can't break through that layer. So once you put a pre-emergent down, whether it be in your lawn or in a flower bed, you do not want to disturb that soil because if you disturb the soil, you disturb the barrier and you open the door for those weeds to germinate. And then this is a good slide. If you're a little too late, uh, you're going to use a little, if you're a little late, so dithiopure would be a good option as, as up to uh, two tiller crabgrass. Your lot late, quinclorac, or phenoxaprop. And again, this will all be recorded. I know those names are not easy to write down quickly, but I'm kind of running behind on, on slides here. And then post emergence crabgrass control, that's June to early August, and that's going to be products with quin quinclorac or phenoxaprop. And so we have active ingredients. So 2,4-D, that's going to take care of your dandelions really well. And then you have some quinclorac, which will take care of some of your broadleaves, but it will also take care of some of those grasses. And then it has dicamba, which I always have heard that if you have an issue with clover, uh, a little dicamba can go a long way, but always be careful when you spray that because um, it does have a tendency to uh, volatilize or move off target after you spray. All right, we are going to bust through this one real quickly. Annual weeds are easier to control in the seedling stage, and that's the same with perennials, but often they're not in the seedling stage. Um, sprays give better control than granules. So I would prefer to spray my, for my perennial weeds in the fall with sprays. Um, avoid extreme temperatures. Um, that's just to help your, make sure that your turf is not so stressed that it will also be injured by the herbicide. Uh, Rain-free periods, they have some good technologies out there. I usually think if I'm going to spray something in the morning, I don't want it to rain until the next day. Uh, some people will cut it a little closer, but just for safety, I try to pick at least a 24-hour period without rain. Um, apply during calm periods, so you want the wind to be between 1 to 5 miles per hour. Uh, don't apply to drought stress, drought stress turf, and as far as applying to after a seedling, You've got to check the label because some of those will need you to have that turf a little more established before you spray anything on it. Broadleaf weed control. So I'm going to skip past this one. 
key ingredients. Um, I'm going to skip through this. Weed stop for lawns. Um, we look at this, we have the 2,4-D dimethylamine salt, mecoprop, dicamba, sulfentrazone. All of those are good things for your broadleaf weeds. Um, I don't want to get too much into this. Uh, other than 2,4-D will help with the dandelions, dicamba will help with your clover. And here's just another three-way mixture. And they have so many combinations of these products that, um, again, if I am to uh, tell someone what to spray, you know, this has 2,4-D ethylene ester. The ester is going to be similar to the amine, which we would work on dandelions, but this might be a little more what I consider hot or burn the leaves down a little quicker. How are we doing on time? I think so yeah, for yellow time, nut, but um, and I can keep going for a little bit. I, I knew this would happen. I enjoyed talking about weeds, so I kind of went a little heavy on the slides. We'll zip through yellow nut sedge real quick. If you have this, I'm sorry. Uh, it's one of those that has tubers, so it can spread. And where you see sort of on the end of this rhizome where these roots are forming, that'll form a tuber, and that can be a new plant. You want to hit these before. July before they set tubers in July and if you have these you need to plan on spraying them at least two years if not three for any sort of control. Sedge hammer or products used for sedge control there are quite a few out there. Um, I believe I have uh, the ones that come in bottles like this are good for different for spot treatment um, but again if you have if you buy something like this in a small container, keep this for a year. If you have extra, don't throw it away. Plan on using it for a couple years after the, the initial spray because those yellow nut sedge will come back. Organic weed control, um, mechanical removal, uh, you know, that's something where we kind of joked about you, there's no resistant weeds for, for those that get pulled. Um, so you can always pull your weeds. I think that's something that uh, with the students maybe not being in school, just throw them out in the yard and have them pick a few hundred dandelions if, if they're bored. Um, I always have to be careful with vinegar because vinegar is one of those things that if you spray it on your lawn, it will kill the grass as well as the weed. And it's more of a burn off than anything. So where you might kill the grass because that vinegar hits the crown of the turf plant, um, you might just burn off the top of a dandelion because it has that storage in the, in the tap root that it can regenerate. So to date, um, there are no effective organic alternatives. You, there are some out there that you can try, um, but again, hand pulling weeds, um, that always seems to work. So we, we've tried a few things and a lot of times they're more burn off, uh, but just give them a try. And uh, if you have an experiment that you've done from before, let us know, because that's always interesting to see how people are doing with those products. Herbicides not to use on your lawn. There are many. Uh, read the label carefully. I think that's going to be next week's talk is the importance of labels. So that's, a, that's an important thing to take notice of. This is a big one. If it says weed and grass killer, it will kill your weeds and your grass. So just be careful. They did a thing last year or a couple years back where it was Roundup for your lawn. And so Roundup could mean many things, but one of them was glyphosate and one of them was 2,4-D and um, other lawn care herbicides. So they were just using that Roundup interchangeably and we ended up killing their lawn. So, but you can find things like the Sure Shot foam and then you can see up right underneath the Roundup label, weed and grass killer. So always read your labels and the uh, products you're using. Why didn't the weed die? So wrong weed, wrong herbicide. Uh, the rates, too low or too high of a rate can decrease your weed uh, or your herbicide efficacy poor spray coverage, and then wrong timing. I know people who have hit dandelions this spring, that will knock them back, but they have the entire spring, summer, and fall to take up water, to grow new leaves. Um, if you're gonna spray dandelions, I really want you to do that in the fall. Same with clover and same with ground ivy. So we already talked about the turf grass weed control for professionals, but here it is in the slides available at the 
Purdue Educational Store, uh, Weeds of the Midwest and uh, Central Canada, Weeds of the Northeast, again, that's one of my favorites. And then this is something, I actually took this picture yesterday. I stare at this every day. It's in my office. It's a turf grass weed identification poster. This is one of those things where if someone comes into my office when they could still come into the office, I'd say point to the weed you have or point to something similar and it makes it much easier to figure out what we're dealing with. And then the Purdue Turf Doctor, just another push for that. This one has been great for extension work because it gives you a lot of information and a little bit of space. Um, the app does cost, I believe, $2, um, and it does take up quite a bit of space on your phone, but this is a good resource to have. And then as always, uh, the Perf Turf Purdue website um, in this bottom section, Turf Grass Weeds, it's gonna have the common weeds, it's gonna have their cultural controls that you can do, biological controls you can do, um, if any, and then also the chemical controls you can do but that's gonna give you the common name. So it's gonna give you the name of the chemical as opposed to what specific products to buy. And then uh, one thing that was established while I was a grad student at Purdue, we did the Purdue Turf Weed Garden. So if you're ever out at the Daniels Turf Center, um, they have this great thing, uh, a demonstration where it has a bunch of weeds out there. When I was taking care of it, you wouldn't believe how difficult it is to keep weeds alive in pots. Uh, they wanna grow uh, a little less comfortably, we, we babied them pretty hard. So um, this was a fun project and I believe they're still keeping that up um, with that. So that is my last slide. I apologize for going a little bit over, um, but if there's any questions, I could stay on for a few minutes and we could uh, maybe get something going. So I already got a couple questions for you, Jeff. Perfect. Um, so Kirk Campbell um, asked about this, and I think he's just asking, I think he knows the answer, but asking for everybody else's sake. Um, he wants to know about wild violet. Wild violet, um, for one, it's probably going to be in the shade. And so that tells me that your turf's probably not going to be very uh, competitive to it. That's one where you're going to need to find a good shade tolerant grass to try to beef up. And then in a perfect world, you'd cut down all your trees and then the turf would just come back. But a lot of times you're going to have to use something with triclopyr or the repeat application of a three-way herbicide. Perfect. Um, I think you've already answered this question. I'll ask it again. Um, is there a fertilizer you recommend for tangle lions? Uh, the... Mm -hmm. One's neighbor uses a uh, commercial fertilizer and it looks like a golf course. The fertilizer they use, I cannot buy. Fertilizer, to rec so to recommend for beefing up, I'm assuming that means to beef up your turf to get rid of dandelions? I would assume so. I don't think you usually grow dandelions. I have before. It's a fun project. Um, but. I would say as long as you have a fertilizer that has a good amount of nitrogen in it, nitrogen is gonna be the big one. Um, but that third analysis number on the, the herbicide or the, the fertilizer bag is gonna be the potassium number. A little bit of potassium goes a long way because dandelions do well in low potassium soils. So if you put a little potassium down, that will sort of rob the dandelions of their um, advantage. Hopefully that answered that. Perfect. Um, Adam wants to know, what can I tank mix 2,4-D to fertilize the sod while I treat? Um, that's one of those questions where there are too many, there are generalizations you can make, but we'd have to look at the specific 2,4-D product you are applying and the specific fertilizer you want to use because compatibility with as many products that are out there, you've got to be careful to make sure you're not mixing something that will uh, reduce your effectiveness of that 2,4-D. But Adam, if you want to email me, we can get something set up for that. I do know that if you are applying 2,4-D and you have hard water, um, you'll need to put some ammonium sulfate in with that tank mixture. And so that's something that I did my research on, which is 
17 pounds of ammonium sulfate per 100 gallons of water. And then you can, um, you can kind of do the math if you have a one gallon uh, spray tank or if you have a 50 gallon spray tank. That's just something where if you're in Indiana, you're probably gonna have hard water and that's something that uh, will, will help reduce that. Okay, moving on. Um, Kurt has another question, and actually I dealt with the same scenario um, with a client um, earlier this spring, but he says he is, has been trying to get some triclopyr. What brand name could contain it, and is it, and is it a restricted chemical? So I don't have names, but I do know that there are three-way, four-way mixtures that have triclopyr in it. It just probably would be something you need to look at the ingredients list for that triclopyr. So um, one thing I need to do for my county, Wabash County, is run down to the, to the uh, hardware store, the places where they sell the herbicides, um, to figure out what they have, because rarely will they sell triclopyr by itself. It is out there, um, but usually what they're selling it might be in a one gallon or two gallon rate, which you might not need for your home lawn. Um, so I would think the best thing for that is to find something that a three-way herb, a four-way herbicide with it in the formulation. So Kurt, if you want to call, feel free. I could help you out on that. Um, I do know just from researching it myself, um, there are some um, things that you can get on Amazon that have that in it. Um, I don't know the effectiveness of it, but um, again, and, Amazon, if you can't find it there, it doesn't exist. Um, another one, Adam said, when I treat dandelion, they almost immediately put on a seed head before they die. Seems like a defense mechanism. Are those seeds viable? Yes. That's just something where if you see a mature seed on a weed plant, like dandelions, you can bet that um, they're going to be able to germinate uh, but that tells me those you're spraying in the spring, try spraying in the fall. Uh, you shouldn't get a flush of seed and it should take care of those before or as they sort of go into their hibernation mode um, in the fall and into winter. Cool. Leslie said last summer we had an issue throughout our two acre yard of nimble weed and goosegrass. Any other control besides glyphosate? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe glyphosate will work for nimble weed. Yeah, that's one of those weeds that um, it's it's an issue that just you can nick it, um, but if you're using glyphosate uh, with a nimble uh, nimble weed or nimble will, um, that might be something. I will be putting my email address in the chat box if you want to send me those. Oh, I just sent that to Kurt. I apologize. Um, I'll get my email address. If you have questions, I can give a little bit of guidance on that. Um, but again, I won't, just depending on where you're at, I won't know what products are available, but I can give you some guidance on what to choose and what to look for for those. Moving on then. Uh, we talked about vinegar already, but Kay said, is vinegar safety on grass going between bricks in a walkway? If you're trying to kill the grass between the bricks and the walkway, yes, but vinegar will, what it does is it'll peel away the protective layer of that, that turf, basically any plant it comes into contact with. So um, if you want the grass to be there, then don't use vinegar on it because vinegar will uh, nick anything that, that it com comes into contact with. Uh, yeah. How can you combat thistle in it in landscape beds? Um, you can one pull them. Two, I have seen folks who will get either the little roundup container and just dab the growing point. So when they start to shoot up, don't think of a, a broadcast sweep. Think of even if you can taking an eyedropper and just very meticulously and carefully um, hit the growing point of that thistle. Um, 
there are some other sources that Rosie Lerner has, um, and I can try to get them get that out to you guys, because um, there is something about hitting it right after it flowers. Um, glyphosate will work, but again, you've got to be real careful with that. Um, Triclopyr would be another one. If you do use 2,4-D, all of these you will have to reapply because thistle does a good job of spreading. Okay, moving on. Um, Karen wants to know, is there any way to, oh wait, I missed a question. Where did it go? Oh, uh, Pat wants to know, how long should you keep children off of the yard after treating? So um, if I'm spraying my sister's yard, I tell her, please have the kids just stay off the yard for the day. They would be okay to be out there when it's dry, but I just say if I'm spraying in the morning, just take the kids to the park that day. Um, that's more of a, that's a little overkill in terms of safety because once it's dry and in the plant, um, it won't transfer anywhere. Um, but again, I, I just tell people, just keep off of it for the day. So along with that, I also um, caution pet owners, the same two, to try to keep your pets out of it after you've sprayed. Um, would hate for poor Fido to... Uh, have a problem with your weed killer. Yes. Um, Bob wants to know what about horse nettle in turf? So that one is, uh, I'm assuming it's a new lawn. Maybe it had previously been a, a, a um, farm field. That's one that if you mow, it should die out. So just keep up with it. If you want to hit it with a broadleaf herbicide, like 2,4-D or a three-way, um, that will ding it up pretty well. Um, but that's one that if you are on a good mowing schedule, uh, kind of like tree saplings, if you have maples or something coming up, after a couple mowings, then you'll kind of rob it of its um, leaves for food and its uh, roots for nutrients and growing. So it'll uh, kind of die off as you as you continue mowing it. Okay, Kim would like to know any ideas for controlling goat weed in a landscape bed. Goat weed, I do not know that one. I would need to if you if you could send me some pictures of that, that would be helpful because I've never heard of goat weed before. So um, Carol asked about the authors for the weed books that you were um, showing. I can tell you that um, staff will be sending out the books, the titles and their authors um, when you get the survey to um, complete after this presentation. Um, another one then said that I did a soil test in garden beds per the recommendation of Allen County Purdue Master Gardener people. Should turf be tested also, or is it assumed to be the same? I would not assume it to be the same because turf has such a recycling of nutrients um, that one, the nitrogen is going to be in flux all the time, but you would need to test it for other nutrients. So I would definitely test your turf and not assume that it was the same as your landscape beds. Uh, Last one then that I have so far is Karen would like to know, is there any way to control weed grasses in the yard? There is, it just depends on what weeds you're talking about. Crabgrass, you would use a pre-emergent. Um, the, the difficult thing about a question like this is there's so many grass species that you want in your yard versus a lot of grass species you do not want in your yard. So that's kind of a case by case issue. I'm sorry to be a little political uh, about that, but it's something where if we know what you're dealing with, there might be something you can spray. Um, but where we were talking about thistles and ground ivy and all those that are hard to control broadleaves, if you have something like quack grass in your lawn, um, that's going to take quite a bit of um, work to get rid of that. So um, that's going to be a case sensitive thing. And yes, you can send me a picture of your weeds. Um, but if you take pictures, I like some that are sort of far away, but then a little closer up um, of the weed. That's, uh, I think, with the uh, 
everyone having a smartphone, it has been really great to be an extension where send me some pictures and I can say, well, uh, you know, these are great. I can get all the information I need, but if it's kind of iffy, then, um, you know, that might need to be a, a site visit or something similar like that. So. I think that takes care.